And Claudius therefore allows him to address his accusers. Now, Paul signals for the mob to be quiet, and they are. And then they paid even closer attention when Paul began to speak to them in the language of the day, the diplomatic language of the day. Our text says Hebrew. It actually is in Aramaic. And he begins his testimony respectfully addressing them as brethren and fathers. And then he restates what he told to Claudius about his ethnicity and hometown. Then he adds that he was a student of the famed Gamaliel and that he was brought up under the law and was as zealous as any of them toward God. And then he says in verse 4, that he was once where they are, in that he radically and violently opposed the spread of the Christian faith. And then he calls as witness the high priest and the council of elders who would bear witness that this was true. Now, in contrast, Paul would later write to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I did what? I persecuted the church of God. We need to remember that today. We are the church of God. We are the people of God. Christ is the head of the church and remains the head of the church today. Now, this too is part of a good testimony. I wanted to draw that to your attention because the fact is what Paul is teaching us through what he said to them uh, the Jews from Ephesus in our text and what he would later write to the church at Corinth reminds us being humbled at your current blessings in light of your troubled past is a good way to approach life. Now I'm sure that most of us had probably heard someone at some point in time share their testimony who talked about their past like they missed it. Or we've heard someone talk about how great life was before they came to Jesus. Oh, the cars I had, I gave them up for Jesus. We lived in a big mansion, I gave it up for Jesus. We did this, we did that, we gave it up. Listen, nobody gave up anything for Jesus except going to hell. That's the only thing you give up. The fact is, coming to Jesus is the best decision anybody can ever make. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, through 11, Paul would also say, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, with a statement like that, I want some clarity on exactly what unrighteousness is, wouldn't you? Now, he says, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, those who have sex outside of marriage, unrepentantly of all of these uh, characteristics he describes, nor idolaters, people that worship things other than God, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I'm glad that he kept talking, aren't you? Yes. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, in this narrative, Paul doesn't tell the Jews, but such were some of you. But instead he says, I was once one of you. Now this is where a good testimony begins. And our first component of our format, so to speak, is simply this. I packaged it kind of corny, but I think you'll see that it makes sense here in a moment. Now listen, here's our first truth this morning. You ready? The value of sharing our past is that it is the past. The value of sharing our past is that it is the past. Now, some years ago here at CCT, I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, but somebody got upset with me. I know, that's amazing, isn't it? Can you imagine? And the reason they got upset with me is because I told them, I don't think you're a good candidate to head up our epic ministry. Our epic ministry is dealing with the issue of coming out from and being set free from addictions. Now, the reason I didn't think that they were a good candidate for heading up our epic ministry is because they were constantly falling back into drug use and they were a chain smoker. So I said to them, I don't think your message on freedom from addiction is going to be very convincing because your present and your past look like the same thing. So they huffed and they puffed and they walked out the door 
and haven't seen them since. But listen, Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Or just realize you're going to suffer just as Christ did. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the what? The flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Read that last sentence again, that he should no longer live the rest of the time in his flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. That tells us the lust of men and the will of God are two different things. Now, this is why what I have warned you about before, a movement today called the hyper-grace movement, is so dangerous because it teaches that grace is all you need and repentance is not part of salvation. Now listen, <clears throat> I've told you before, and I'll mention it again this morning because I feel like I should, and that is I see all over social media that grace covers our sin. Grace does not cover our sin. Blood covers our sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Grace is God's method. It's the means by which, because of his divine attribute of love, he sent his son into the world to die for our sins. And in order for his blood to cover our sins, it had to be of a sinless nature. And Jesus was sinless as he walked this earth, died, stayed in the tomb, resurrected early in the morning on the first day of the week, ascended before three witnesses into heaven, and he's coming again with a great cloud of witnesses someday, and that will include you and I. That had nothing to do with our message. I just like saying it. <laughs> now, some of those who say that the, in the hyper-grace movement is repentance is not a necessary part of salvation. And according to them, your past and your present can look the same as long as you're saved and have made an out loud confession of faith. Now, listen, there is huge value in our past when it is the past. It establishes a contrast between what we used to be and who we are now in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you can or shouldn't share your faith until you're perfect, because then nobody would ever share their faith. It doesn't mean you have to be sinless to share your faith, because then nobody would ever share their faith. It means that we need to do what Paul does here. And when we have something we have victory over, we need to use it as part of our testimony. Paul said, I share the same past as your present. And I have been delivered from it. And we need to remember 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone, say anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Some things have passed away. No, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Paul would later say to the church at Galatia in 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the what? Flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And later in the same letter in 524, he would say, And those who are Christ have crucified what? The flesh with its passions and desires. Listen, Paul could speak with authority on the issue of persecuting the church because it was his past. I can speak with authority on overcoming drugs and alcohol because it is my past. I am free indeed from those things and it has not infringed upon my presence and therefore I can use it as part of my testimony. And the value of sharing our past is that it is the past. Does that make more better sense now? That's what I thought. So having shared about his prior condition, Paul now moves to his personal transformation in 6 to 13. Man, I'm feeling pretty good all of a sudden. Now, it happened as I journeyed and came... What, why don't we just stick to the chapter we were in? No, we're right. I told you I'm on a medication. Leave me alone. Now, it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered... Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since 
I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me. I came into Damascus, then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Or Paul is saying, my sight was, was restored. Now, as Paul begins his testimony, he opens with a, something that has sadly become a cliche today. And that is, he saw the light. And then he gives specifics concerning this encounter that those who were around him saw the light, but they didn't hear the verbal exchange between Paul and Jesus. Now, at the exposure of Paul's sin of persecuting the church and the revelation that when the church is persecuted, the head of the church is persecuted, he responds with, what shall I do, Lord? Now, the word Lord means supreme authority. Now, let me ask you, knowing of what Paul spoke about his prior condition, considering now his transformation, was Paul's present radically different from Paul's past? Yes, it was. And this is a format for a good testimony. This is his personal transformation. And the fact that he called Jesus Lord opens the door for a little bit of doctrinal housekeeping. Now, to Titus in 1.4, Paul would say to Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our what? Our Savior. Now, there is a teaching today that is growing more and more popular that is actually a refutation of what is called Lordship Salvation. And Lordship Salvation is simply the belief that true salvation is going to manifest itself in the form of repentance in one's life. In other words, when Jesus is recognized or accepted as Lord, he's also going to be submitted and surrendered to, or as Savior, he's also going to be submitted and surrendered to as Lord. Now, the opponents of this say only accepting Christ as Savior is necessary for salvation, and to say that you must submit to him as Lord is teaching a works righteousness gospel. Now, their argument is that repentance, which means to change the mind, is uh, strictly limited to changing your mind about who Jesus is and therefore doesn't require any submission to him as Lord in order to be saved. And yet, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And then he illustrated the point by the uh, contrast between the house built on the rock and the one on the sand, the storm beating against both of those houses, one stood and the other fell. Now, some say and argue today that only a mental acknowledgement of the personage of Jesus as Savior is necessary. And the uh, 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 teaching regarding salvation in the theological term is called soteriology. And some would say this is a soteriological issue at heart. But the fact is, listen... In the testimony of Paul, he transitions from persecuting the Lord to submitting to the Lord at the very moment of his conversion. So Paul, I would say, would be one who would endorse lordship salvation. And I don't really even like that label being put on it because the fact is all over the New Testament, Jesus is spoken of as the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why wouldn't anybody have to submit to the supreme authority? Well, he's just my savior, but he's not my boss. Well, then why did we have so many bumper stickers and t-shirts say years ago that my boss is a Jewish carpenter? Well, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. Well, at least he was on earth. The fact is, now he's seated at the right hand of majesty on high, living daily to make intercession for you and I. My boss is the king of kings and lord of lords. My boss speaks universes into existence. My boss says, let there be light and there is light. My boss created everything that we now see and enjoy in the span of six days and took Sunday off. That's who my boss is. And if somebody's got that kind of power, I'm going to call him Lord and I'm going to submit to what he says. I have no problem with the concept that so many are refuting today. If he's your savior, he's going to be your Lord. Now... Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul would later write this, I beseech you, or I plead with you, brethren, 
by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then he describes what that looks like. Holy, acceptable to God, which means there are things that are unacceptable, which is your reasonable service. And then he goes on to explain what's acceptable to God. And that includes not being conformed to this what? To this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then he would later write in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8 through the church at Thessaloniki, for this is the will of God. Your what? Sanctification. I heard a pastor one time brag that in all his years of preaching, he's never once used the word sanctification. And as soon as he said that, he said, I thought the concept, but I never used the word. Well, the word's in the Bible. And the fact is, I don't think that's something to brag about. I think that's something to be ashamed of. We ought to teach the Bible and its terminology. Amen? Amen. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. In other words, have sexual self-control, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. And nobody should teach contrary to scripture concerning sexual behavior because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in what? Holiness. Holiness. Now listen close to what he says. Therefore, he who rejects this, that we ought to live holy, does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. What did Jesus tell the disciples in John 14, 26, when he said he was going to send them a helper who would come alongside? He said, he's going to teach you everything. He will teach you all things and call to mind the things that I taught you. So the Spirit is going to be consistent with the written Word of God, and Jesus is presented metaphorically as the Word of God. Now, Paul seemed to be under the impression that proving the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God includes sanctified living or being set apart from your former behaviors and actions. Now, here's why this is crucial to a good testimony or testimony format. You ready? My wife is ready. Thank you, honey. Anybody else ready? Listen, here we go. People may reject the inspiration of Scripture, but they cannot deny a changed life. People may reject the inspiration of Scripture. They do that today, right? But they, may, they cannot deny a changed life. Now this is why Paul started with his past. So he could present his transformation, his proof that he was within the good and acceptable and perfect will of God by submitting to Christ as Lord after he accepted him as Savior simultaneously, I should say. Now... Believing you must submit to Christ as Lord if you're truly saved is not adding to the blood of Jesus. It's simply the evidence that the blood of Jesus has saved your soul. And thus Hebrews would say in 12, 14 to 15, pursue peace with all people you like. And pursue people with all, peace with all people, comma, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now listen close. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the what? The grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many come become defiled. Now, I have to remind you this morning of the definition of grace by first saying, we've heard Pastor Chuck, he has a wonderful book called Why Grace Changes Everything. And I'm not saying that uh, his understanding was inaccurate by any stretch of the imagination, because the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word Cain, C-H-A-N-E, if you want to spell it in English characters, or our alphabet, means to stoop to an inferior in kindness. And when we read that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, what it means is Noah found unmerited favor. And he did experience that. However, the New Testament word, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, again, spelling it in English characters, it means divine inspiration and its reflection in the life. It's translated as either grace or graciousness, but its definition is divine inspiration in the heart and its reflection in the life. Now, here's why I wanted to bring that up. Because Hebrews says, be careful or looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. How can you fall short of unmerited favor? Boy, you really got to be messed up if you can't even get unmerited favor, right? Right? So, however, if you look at the definition of grace, the word charis in Hebrews 12, 14, 
divine inspiration in the heart and its reflection in the life, you can understand how it's possible to fall short of grace. We have been saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. We have nothing to boast about as far as it pertains to our salvation. The Lord did all the saving. Our job was by faith believing. Amen? Amen. Now, Paul says to the Jews from Ephesus, I once thought like you did. And then I met Jesus. And then everything started to change. I surrendered to him as Lord, as I accepted him as Savior. He changed my course of thinking and direction in life. Now, Paul also incorporates Ananias in his testimony of personal transformation as a credible, well-respected witness of his moment of conversion, which reminds us that Christianity is not a secret society. There ought to be other people who are bearing witness of what happened in our lives. There ought to be other people who see the change that took place and bear witness, even if they don't believe what it is that we believe. And it's kind of interesting. I was reminded this morning of a friend of mine who his father had died. I grew up with him in the Nazarene church and his dad had died uh, relatively young. And so I went over to the church I was raised in. Terry and I went to the funeral. And uh, this, he actually, uh, the guy that I hung around with, he sang in our wedding. And so he was a close friend. And when I went and we paid our respects to the family, I walked up to my friend's mom and I said, I'm praying for you. And she said, that sounds so funny coming from you. And I realized what she was saying. And it was really a lesson for me because I'd had a negative influence on her son. I was not in a good place in my teenage years, even though I was still attending the church. I had drug her son into things that he shouldn't have been doing, that I shouldn't have been doing. And after 25 years, she hadn't forgotten it, but she couldn't deny that I was different. And what I said might have sounded funny because of the mouth it was coming from, but she couldn't deny that God had changed me, even though it was strange to her. And that's going to be true for all of us. Some people are going to say, you? I've told you before how many people from my former days have showed up at this church to see if it was true. Not just if I was a Christian, but a pastor too? You? you got to be kidding. And listen, that's how radical our change should be. That's how our personal transformation should be in the eyes of other people. Now, there's going to be levels of radicalness, so to speak. I was a violent, abusive drunk, and my life changed dramatically. My marriage was over. My wife had left me and taken our daughter with us. But now we've been back together over 40 years, and I'm starting to grow on her. I am different than I used to be. And God has done a great work in our marriage and in our life. And I'm, I hope you're going to let me stick around for the next few years. But this is what God does. This is his power. And when we come to him and accept him as Savior, submit to him as Lord, there's going to be a radical transformation from our prior condition. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, let's pick it up and finish off in 14 through 21. And then he said, Ananias speaking, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he, Jesus, said to me, Paul, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Little teaser about next time. They listened to him until he said this. I think it's interesting. They listened to him call Jesus Lord. They listened to him talk about Jesus as Savior. But as soon as he mentioned saving the Gentiles, they were out. They were done. They said, kill this guy. Now, little housekeeping before we dig in. Mark 1, 4 to 5 says Jesus came, or John rather, came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of what? 
repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and all were all baptized by him in the Jordan 